In an ionic or polar organic reaction, ions appear as reactants, intermediates, and products. And in these reactions, the key idea is encapsulated by Lewis acid base theory. The idea that there are electron rich atoms and electron poor atoms and spontaneous polar reactions involve a flow of electrons from the electron rich atoms to the electron poor atoms. Seeing this and keeping this idea in mind throughout your study of organic chemistry is going to be absolutely critical. Ionic reactions occur when a species with high electron density, which we're going to call a nucleophile or a Lewis base, gets together with a species with low electron density, which we're going to call an electrophile or Lewis acid. And throughout these slides, you will see me highlight nucleophiles in red and electrophiles in blue. And the reason is made clear by these electron density maps, where regions of high electron density are highlighted in red, and regions of low electron density are highlighted in blue. Methyl chloride is a classic example of an organic electrophile at carbon, a species with partial positive charge on a carbon atom. And we can see that in the electron density map by the blue-green structure or color around that carbon. Awesome electrophile. Methyl lithium, on the other hand, is an example of a classic carbon-centered nucleophile with negative charge at the carbon. And we can see that in the electron density map via the red highlighting around that carbon. So you'll see me highlight nucleophiles red and electrophiles blue throughout these videos and my Organic 2 videos and hopefully every other video I've made related to nucleophiles and electrophiles. And again, seeing these is going to be extremely important throughout your studies of organic chemistry because it's the union of nucleophiles and electrophiles that really makes organic reactions go. In the remainder of this video, we're going to talk about what makes a good nucleophile, what makes a good electrophile, and how to recognize these in organic species. Let's start with nucleophiles. Nucleophiles are nucleus loving. They love positive charge. They love positive charge because they have an excess of negative charge, specifically high electron density. So we might have full-blown negative formal charge. We might have a negatively charged ion, an anion. Non-bonding lone pairs are also a hallmark of nucleophilic species, since these non-bonding electrons are relatively unstable. Electrons involved in bonding are stabilized, so non-bonding lone pairs logically then are going to be higher energy, less stable than bonding pairs of electrons. One thing to point out about nucleophiles before we get into recognizing them structurally is that the basic reactivity of a Lewis base is to donate a pair of electrons to an electrophile like, like this. So we could represent this with a curved arrow, something like that. This is highly similar to what a Bronsted base does. A Bronsted base donates a pair of electrons to a proton donor like so, and an HA bond happens to break. But if we pay attention to that first curved arrow, it looks very similar in both cases. So nucleophiles, what we might call Lewis bases, can also act as Bronsted bases. How do you spot nucleophiles in organic compounds? You can actually consider the structural stability factors. And to recognize a good nucleophile, we're looking for a lack of many of these stabilizing factors. So low electronegativity a lack of resonance delocalization, localized negative charge. It's a hallmark of a great nucleophile. Hybridization, we're looking for sp3 hybridized lone pairs, relatively unstable. Inductive effects, we don't want atoms like fluorine or maybe even oxygen in the vicinity of a negative charge or a lone pair, which would stabilize the, those electrons by induction and this kind of thing. So I wanted to highlight a few examples of on this slide of nucleophilic molecules and where the nucleophilic atoms are. If you'd like, this is a good opportunity to pause the video and see if you can spot the nucleophilic atoms in these species. And I've added the lone pairs to get us started with this process. All right, let's start with the two molecules along the top. This molecule is ethanol. And when it comes to recognizing ethanol as a nucleophile, the first thing we should look for is non-bonding lone pairs. And we see two on this oxygen, and that oxygen is a decent nucleophile. It's not great. It's not a great Bronsted base, for that matter. But 
if we're looking at that molecule as a nucleophile, say this is combined with a very strong Lewis acid, the first place our eye should be drawn should be this oxygen with its non-bonding lone pairs. The conjugate base of ethanol, ethoxide, is a much better nucleophile at now the negatively charged oxygen atom. So now we have very high electron density at that O-, and this is quite a good nucleophile, much better than the neutral ethanol. In this case, on the bottom right, we've got two atoms that have lone pairs, the nitrogen and the oxygen, and either of these has the potential to act as a nucleophile. But if we think about electronegativity here, right, we'll reason that the nitrogen should be a better nucleophile than the oxygen. Why is that? Well, nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, holds on to its electrons less tightly in a colloquial sense, right? So it's going to be more inclined to give that pair of electrons away. We already understand that nitrogen is generally going to be a better Bronsted base than oxygen, and for a very similar reason, this nitrogen is generally going to be a better nucleophile than oxygen. Again, drawing on this analogy between Lewis basicity and Bronsted basicity. And this last case is highly interesting. This is the amino acid aspartate, or aspartic acid, in its dianionic ionization state. We see we have a nitrogen, very similar to this nitrogen, so we would expect that to be nucleophilic via the lone pair on that nitrogen atom. We also see negatively charged oxygen atoms here and here, and it's reasonable to expect those to be nucleophilic as well, just like this negatively charged oxygen up here. But ask yourself which you expect to be the stronger nucleophile, this O- minus or this O-? Minus. In fact, this O- minus in ethoxide is a much better nucleophile than the negatively charged oxygens in aspartate. That's because that negative charge is actually delocalized over not one, but two oxygens thanks to the magic of resonance delocalization. This is a stabilizing effect right? Resonance means that all of the lone pairs on this negatively charged oxygen are stabilized, delocalized over three atoms, and the negative charge is really not stuck on one oxygen, but spread out over two oxygens in the case of both of these functional groups. A more interesting and potentially more challenging comparison is between the two carboxylate groups. So if you had to choose one of these two to be the better nucleophile which would you choose? I'll leave that one up to you, but it's an interesting comparison because the only difference between the two is their distance to the NH2 group. This one is a little bit farther away than this one, and that has definitely a measurable effect on the basicity and nucleophilicity of those carboxylate groups. Electrophiles are electron-loving species. Low electron density, positive or full-blown positive charge, meaning they want to accept electrons to become neutral. So something like a carbon linked to an electronegative atom or group where the carbon is left partially positive, or a carbocation with positive charge on the carbon that's not satisfying the octet rule is a classic example of an electrophile. So to show some examples of electrophiles on this slide, the first one worth pointing out is the carbocation itself. This is a six electron carbon. It wants another pair of electrons to satisfy the octet rule, and it is an awesome electrophile at that carbon as a result. One thing to note here is that Lewis acids can also often act as Bronsted acids. So carbocations often have these hydrogens linked to the carbon adjacent to the positive charge right here. These can be lost to form a neutral species, here an alkene, an H+. And this shows how this electrophile can also act as a Bronsted acid via this appropriately positioned H. We'll see that again in another one of the examples on this slide. To find electrophiles, I think, is more difficult in general than spotting nucleophiles, because with nucleophiles, we're looking for something concrete, a non-bonding lone pair a negative formal charge. With electrophiles, the electrophilicity is often hidden under the surface, and these next two examples are awesome instances of that. You may look at this molecule and kind of not know where to begin. Maybe you'd notice there are a couple of non-bonding lone pairs on the oxygen. Those might be weakly nucleophilic. But the major reactivity of this molecule comes from considering its second best resonance form pushing the CO electrons up to oxygen, revealing positive charge at this carbon. That carbon is partially positive, as evidenced by this alternative resonance form that would result from this resonance um, type electron flow. 
And so it's a great electrophile at carbon. This is an example of carbon linked to an electronegative atom or group. The CO double bond, that carbon is almost always a potential electrophile. That doesn't have to be a double bond. When carbon is linked via a single bond to an electronegative halogen atom, chlorine, bromine, and iodine most notably, we also get an electrophilic carbon right here. And we'll see these acting as electrophiles on a regular basis, these alkyl halides. The bottom two examples just highlight some additional situations where we want to consider alternative resonance forms to recognize electrophilic centers. For example, here, we could push each of these pi bonds up to the more electronegative atom, exposing positive charge on the carbon to which that heteroatom is linked. So we've got two electrophilic centers here. This carbon doubly bonded to oxygen, and this carbon doubly bonded to nitrogen. Now, just as we mentioned in the case of nucleophiles, when it comes to judging electrophiles, we also want to consider the stability factors and how they influence the reactivity of potential electrophilic centers. So here, for example, if we were asked which of these is the more electrophilic center, we could use ideas about electronegativity and say, well, this nitrogen is not pulling so much on the electron density of this pi bond as this oxygen is pulling on its pi bond because nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen. And so there's more partial positive charge on this carbon linked to the more electronegative atom. So I would expect this carbon, part of the CO double bond, to be the better electrophile here. In essence, an electronegativity argument with a little bit of resonance thrown in there. And this last example, this last example highlights an important point. Positive formal charge does not necessarily point you to the electrophilic atom in a structure. So you may look at this and say, oh, this oxygen has positive charge. I see positive formal charge, just like I did in the case of the carbocation. That oxygen is electrophilic. But it's not. On the contrary, that oxygen is perfectly happy. It's satisfying the octet rule. And so to accept another pair of electrons would actually leave that oxygen violating the octet rule in a problematic way. The right way to think about a structure like this is to consider the alternative resonance form. The alternative resonance form pushing the CO electrons, pi electrons, up to oxygen would leave positive charge at this carbon. That is the electrophilic center here, the carbon, not the oxygen. One thing that the positively charged oxygen does tip us off to is the potential of this hydrogen to act as a Bronsted acid, actually highly analogous to this case above. Um, this can be deprotonated by a Bronsted base, and that would leave this oxygen neutral right after the OH bond breaks toward oxygen. And so that O plus does have an effect on Bronsted acidity of this molecule at that hydrogen, but the Lewis acidic center, the atom that really wants to accept electrons, is this carbon. And the alternative resonance form, again, I'm going to go ahead and draw this out, it's the alternative resonance form with positive charge on that carbon that really tips us off to this. One general idea here that can be highly useful is, if you want to know the reactivity of a molecule, consider not its best resonance form, which often has all atoms satisfying the octet and positive charge on relatively exotic places like O plus or N plus. Consider the second best resonance form, where positive charge often shows up on carbon and re we reveal these sort of hidden electrophilic sites of reactivity. This slide summarizes the ideas we've talked about with respect to recognizing nucleophiles and electrophiles, and it does add a couple of important points that I wanted to emphasize. Pi bonds can also act as nucleophiles. And in the absence of a lone pair, or even in competition with lone pairs in many cases, pi bonds will act as nucleophiles. When it comes to electrophiles, we talked about the carbocation being a classic example of an electrophile and the fact that there are only six total electrons here, and so that carbon wants to accept an additional electron pair. There's also an empty p orbital at this carbon that's worth keeping in mind. When we get to reactions involving carbocation intermediates, we'll return to this idea. Carbocations are trigonal planar and sp2 hybridized, and that unhybridized p orbital in a carbocation is empty. And that is really a key site of reactivity in three dimensions for the carbocation. Nucleophiles come from above or below to engage with that empty p orbital. Let's practice identifying potential nucleophilic and electrophilic centers in this molecule. And let's remind ourselves first in general terms of what we're looking for here. To spot nucleophiles, we're looking for non-bonding lone pairs and pi bonds 
that are inclined to be given away by the atoms that they're associated with. And for the electrophiles, well, here we're looking for partial positive charge or a full-blown positive charge, as well as polarized pi bonds that we can push up to the more electronegative atom in the bond, showing that the less electronegative atom is electrophilic. So the first place I would start here probably is drawing in implied lone pairs. And we've got two implied lone pairs at this oxygen indicating that that oxygen is a candidate nucleophile. Those lone pairs, one of the lone pairs, could be given away to a Lewis acid or a Bronsted acid for that matter. So that is a nucleophilic site for sure. But the pi bond is also nucleophilic. And because that pi bond is associated with carbon atoms, carbon is relatively low on the electronegativity scale, those pi electrons could be given away to even a decent electrophile. Now, what about electrophilic centers in this molecule? Well, think about where we have polarized bonds, polarized pi bonds or sigma bonds. The most polarized bond that jumps out at me is the OH bond, with partial positive charge on the hydrogen, partial negative charge on the oxygen. This points us to the idea that the hydrogen is Bronsted acidic, right? It's not the strongest Bronsted acid in the world, but if we're looking for something, right, or we know we're putting this in the presence of a very, very strong nucleophile or Bronsted base, we want to recognize that this is a point of electrophilicity and Lewis and Bronsted acidity. It's also possible, at least theoretically, for this carbon to act as an electrophile because, of course, this carbon-oxygen bond is also polarized toward the oxygen atom like this. This is not so important um, because this carbon is not easily accessible by nucleophiles, and nucleophiles and bases will much more rapidly react with the hydrogen rather than carbon. But it's important to note, and if we could convert this OH group into something with actual full-blown positive charge, say by protonating the oxygen, then it becomes a lot more appealing for, to use that carbon as an electrophile. So that's worth noting here as well.